Before we open the Bible today and talk a little bit about Acts chapter 2, I thought we'd just spend a couple moments in silence. I just invite you to, in the quietness of your own heart, ask God to talk to you today, to maybe give you one or two takeaways from this message and to get all the distractions away. So let's just take a moment of silence and just talk to God and ask him to really talk to you and connect with you today. Let's pray. a fascinating phenomenon. Wind, a gentle wind on a summer day can bring a lot of relief and a lot of comfort. The powerful wind that's associated with a tornado or a hurricane can lift a house, can wreak havoc and leave a trail of destruction. Wind can bring rain that waters the land and wind can bring drought that dries up the land. The sailboat can capture the wind and propel a vessel across the open waters, and uh, wind can provide a child with a fun afternoon of kite flying on a spring day. With all of that, it's interesting that we don't see wind. We don't know wind. We know what wind does. It's hard to, to actually capture and to actually describe wind, but we see what it's about. In the Bible, it's interesting that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word that's translated spirit is also translated wind or breath. So the very same concept of spirit and breath throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus uh, draws this analogy very clearly in John chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can't hear the wind, but you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Very clearly linking the, the way the wind works with the way the Spirit of God works among us. And this is really helpful as we get to Acts chapter 2 in our study today. We're discovering and looking at the empowerment of God's church to do the mission of God. So if we look back a little bit at Acts chapter 1, we find the resurrected Christ addressing his followers before he ascended to the Father. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you, John baptized in water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 1, 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me, everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So following after that, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples got together and they re replaced uh, Judas with Matthias and the apostolic band. And then we pick up the narrative in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. So I'm going to read first 12 verses of Acts chapter 2, and then we're going to talk about this experience and apply it in our own lives. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound of heaven from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At this time there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by these believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, 
Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Ferga, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things that God has done. <clears throat> they stood amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They ask each other. So the disciples, after witnessing Jesus' life and walking with him and his death and his resurrection and all the tension and all the uncertainty that comes with that, and then they spent 40 days <clears throat> with Jesus. He had appeared to them at times, teach them, remind them, reinforce this kingdom message that he had been teaching. And he told them to wait. And now the wait is over because Pentecost is here. And Pentecost, we think of it as when the Holy Spirit was poured out, which is true. But before that, Pentecost was an Old Testament festival, also known as the Festival of Weeks, when the harvest was celebrated with special sacrifices. You can read more about the Old Testament celebration of the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 to 21. So the believers, probably more than just the 12, were gathered together. We don't know exactly where they were gathered, but they were gathered waiting like Jesus had told them to. But this time was different. Without warning, the sound of a rushing wind filled the house where they were gathering. The wind, the Bible often uses wind as a sign of God's presence. So that symbolic is very, very appropriate. Combined with the sound of wind, a flame appeared and this flame divided itself. It was a visible flame and divided itself among the people. And it looked like tongues resting above uh, among the people. And this is a symbol of the presence of God. Again, in the Old Testament, if you go to Mount Sinai and Exodus 19 and other places, fire is a, is an is a symbol, uh, an image of the presence of God among his people doing something special. It also takes us back to Luke chapter 3, verse 16, where John the Baptist answered the people that were asking him questions, saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We also know the Holy Spirit Descending visibly on people is a mark of, of kind of inaugurating a work. We, we see in Luke chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, when Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his public ministry, that the Holy Spirit descended upon him visibly like a dove in the form of a dove as a, as a cosmic kind of marker that this is a new chapter in the redemptive book of God of what he's doing to redeem all things to himself. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4. We'll dive right in here. Uh, everyone was present, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, when you read this verse, most of us are drawn to the second, to the, the latter portion of it, speaking in other languages, and we miss the most important part, which is the very opening phrase, and that is, everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't just sitting on the bench somewhere waiting to get called into the game. The Holy Spirit's been active for all time. The Old Testament, Genesis, we see the Holy Spirit active in the work of creation. The Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was active in the life of Jesus. But now something different is happening. This is something new or something fresh. The prominence of the Holy Spirit is really, really taking center stage here. In the Old Testament, we see the sacrificial system where if you wanted to connect with God, you would bring your animal sacrifices to the temple. And through the sacrificial system of the priesthood, you would, you would then know you are right with God. In Jesus' life, instead of going to the temple or tabernacle to, to get those sacrifices, God is present in Christ. It's, it's God with us, Emmanuel. So if you want to see God in the life of Jesus, you would look at Jesus and see God. So in the Old Testament, you look at the sacrificial system. In the Gospels, you look at Jesus. This is a new era. Now, the Holy Spirit is poured out on all people. We no longer have to go to the temple to be right with God. We no longer have to go find the, the man Jesus to see God. Now he dwells in me. He dwells in you. 
He's among us. He's poured out on all of us corporately as the church and individually. We have God in us and we are in God. This is a new era in God's redemptive plan. So much of the rest of the New Testament is about us appropriating and working out this truth that God dwells in me. God dwells in us through the Holy Spirit for the purpose of accomplishing his mission. Now, even in these first two chapters of Acts, we see the terminology can get a little bit fuzzy. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, filling of the Holy Spirit, because we see in in chapter 2, verse 4, the writer uses the term filled with the Holy Spirit. Back in chapter 1, Jesus told his followers in a few days, you would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So at least in this portion of Acts, baptism of the Spirit, filling with the Spirit seem to be used synonymously. And it's really problematic. Uh, Adam's mentioned this the first couple of messages in Acts. It's problematic to, to take what happens in the book of Acts and see it as a one-to-one as to what ought to happen in our lives. It, not normative for all believers. It's descriptive of what happened, but there are transferable principles and certainly elements of continuity into our own experience. But when we look to what the filling of the Holy Spirit is or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the role that the Holy Spirit plays in the church, here's just a standard definition of kind of the the biblical theological definition from the New Testament. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is one of the gifts of salvation by which God's very presence in the person of the Spirit indwells the church corporately and Christians individually drawing them into the life of the triune God. That is true, all Christians of all time. Now in Acts chapter 2, something special happened because this is the inauguration of this era of redemptive history. And beneath, even beneath that general definition, we have a lot of different opinions, understanding, interpretation, thoughts about how the Holy Spirit works in the church. In the, in the Christian community, in the evangelical community, among people that are equally committed to the truth of God's word, there are people that have different ways of explaining and understanding what the Holy Spirit does. The terminology used of the Holy Spirit. Are we filled with the Holy Spirit? Baptized with the Holy Spirit? Is it baptism all at once? Later, do you, do you become filled with the Holy Spirit? Separate from being baptized with the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of ways of kind of parsing that. And, and I think it's a little bit fuzzy We'll find even a little bit later in Acts, in Acts chapter 6, when the apostles needed to put a team together to help with the food program of the church because there were some people, some widows were being left out. Here's what they said. Speaking, so they're speaking to believers, which we would say are people that are all filled with the Holy Spirit, right? If you are a Christian, based on that definition, you have the Holy Spirit in you. So among all of those who are Spirit-filled, Pick seven men who are well-respected and full of the Spirit. Well, but aren't we all? So apparently, apparently there, there was a way to describe among all of those who are full of the Spirit, there are some who are visibly full of the Spirit. They're, they're, they're dedicated. You see the Spirit life in them in a way that's different. We also see in Ephesians 5.18 When Paul's talking to believers about how to live, he says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, and this is a command, be filled with the Spirit. That's something you are about, you're directed to, you're you're focused on. So uh, even as we understand how this is applied among believers, we have different ways of, of seeing how it's worked out, but that's under the heading of knowing the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church for a purpose. So let's jump back to Acts chapter 2. One really important observation in verses 2 and two to 4 is that the Holy Spirit is one spirit. One spirit poured out on everyone who was there gathered in that room. And that Holy Spirit separated into what the, the people there would see as visible signs of flame on each person. One spirit we all share, which is amazing and it points to the unity that we have in Christ that The same Holy Spirit who was poured out at Pentecost on the apostles and believers is the one who dwells in you today, the one who dwells in me today. It's one spirit binding us all together for the purpose of accomplishing God's work. I think this is really, really important. We're united with every disciple, with every Christ follower in all time and all places all over the world. 
I was with Frank Agavino this week. We went down to Jubilee Community Church in North St. Louis and we're visiting with the, the leaders of the church there. And I ran into Leroy Gill, who's one of the pastors there. And Leroy and I, I probably haven't seen Leroy person to person for a few years. We've known each other and we talked for a while and gave him an embrace. And I said, it's really good to reconnect with you, Leroy. And he looked at me and smiled and he said, you know we can't be disconnected, right? And I'm like, you're yeah, right. We can't be disconnected. We haven't seen each other for years, but we can't be disconnected because of this, because we share the same spirit. So in Jerusalem, at this time, people were there from all parts of the world living in Jerusalem. Many may have come for the festival of weeks, the Feast of Weeks that was going on. Probably some have moved back from being in exile, from being in the, the diaspora, it's called, where the Jews, Jewish people were exiled all around that region. Others may have been there visiting, as I said. So there were multiple languages spoken in Jerusalem during this festival. And there was a large commotion associated with the Holy Spirit coming. And the disciples drew a large crowd. Verse 4 tells us, that the Holy Spirit gave the believers the ability to speak in the languages of those who were gathered. The long list of nationalities in verses 9 through 12 tell us the stretch and the scope of the people who were amazed at what they heard. Here's a graphic that shows you the, the geographic spread of what happened in that moment when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Jerusalem. These are all the, the regions of people who were in Jerusalem at Pentecost that day. And at least they, they could go back or, or had the opportunity to go back and to take this message of what God had done in his kingdom back to other people. Now, it's easy to get caught up in the speculation of this miracle. I don't think it was just a miracle of hearing. Some people say the, the apostles spoke in their language and the miracle was everyone heard in their own language. But it does seem to, to indicate that they actually spoke in other languages. And there are a lot of studies that are trying to figure out what is the, how does this work of speaking in other languages supernaturally tie into the spiritual gifts that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 and other places. Uh, I think it's safe to say that there's, there's probably continuity and discontinuity between the tongues here, the ability to speak in other languages and the gift of tongues that Paul talks about. Continuity because it's the Holy Spirit giving it, the Holy Spirit guiding it, and it's for a purpose of, of accomplishing God's glory and his kingdom. Discontinuity, because it seems like there's a really clear, specific purpose for this supernatural ability to speak in, in other languages because the people there needed to get this message out. So I would say there's probably continuity and discontinuity. But we, we do need to guard against trying to speculate on things that distract from the Im impact of this event and of what God was doing. God put people in the right place at the right time to hear his message so that this wonderful testimony and witness of what Jesus Christ has done would, would spread throughout the world. And that's really what this, I think the, the real thrust of this section in Acts chapter 2 is all about. See, from the very early chapters in Genesis, God is a God who's on mission to declare his love to all people, to all nations, to everyone on this earth. Even God's calling of Abraham in the Old Testament and the special calling of the people of Israel, if you look back, that was not just for the people of Israel. God's calling Abraham and and choosing this people was to bless all people. There was, there was, a, there was a, a mission to that, that this was supposed to be for everybody. And in Acts 2, describes how the Holy Spirit empowers these people here to reach out to all nations, because this is an international, multicultural, multilingual experience. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. It's all right here. So the same Holy Spirit who was poured out in Acts 2 is poured out on us today. And the words of Jesus are just as applicable today as they were then. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But that power is for a purpose. That power is for a purpose. It's not given to us. The Holy Spirit is not given to us so that we can build shrines and programs and cater to our needs. That's not why the Holy Spirit has been poured out on us. 
The Holy Spirit has not been poured out on us so we can build a fortress against people that, that don't look like us or believe like us or think like us. That's not why the Holy Spirit was poured out on us. Jesus said very clearly, you will receive power so that you will be my witnesses telling people about me. Now let's talk about this for a few minutes. We're often drawn into big campaigns of elaborate strategies for reaching people with the gospel. I think the strategy that we come up with in Acts uh, and the way the New Testament really tells us to share our story is something really simple. So we're going old school to do this. Thank you, uh, Andrew. We're going to talk a little bit about, I, I think we mess up sometimes. The, the, I'm going to oversimplify this, but I think I'm on track. The way we approach, the premise for reaching the lost in evangelical church can probably be summed up kind of like this. We're right and they're wrong and we need to help them not be wrong. We need to help them be right. And that's how we approach things. You know, it's like no wonder the world doesn't want to hear us because we approach evangelism like we've got this. We're right. They're wrong. Let's help them be right. And, and he, as well-meaning as that might be, it's pretty offensive, isn't it? And what Jesus said is you're going to be my witnesses. You're, it's not you're going to correct everybody's theology. I think the Holy Spirit's actually better at correcting theology than I am anyway, so I'm going to let him do that. So here's just a little, a little diagram that, that I think is helpful for us in talking about the Jerusalem part of this telling people about, about the work that Jesus has done. So if you just think of your life as kind of this process, you're kind of always going around this cycle. This is the everyday Christian life kind of a thing. And so you've got home, Work, school, your neighbors, uh, your hobbies, your pace of life. That's just where you go, what you do, um, where you go for coffee. Where the favorite restaurant you go to regularly, you get to know people, on and on. You can, you can add others. Just think about some of the people who are in those areas in your life. It's just even maybe two people in each one of those. That is your sphere of influence spiritually. That is your most immediate area where God wants to use this filling of the Holy Spirit in you to make an impact for him. And well, how do we do that? We don't have to, it's not something that we do. The first step is actually you pray. And way too often, we try to do the Holy Spirit's work without the Holy Spirit because we, oh yeah, we got to reach our neighbors. Let's figure out a strategy to do that. If, if, if God is about drawing people to himself and wants to use me to do it, I'm assuming he's already going ahead of me and helping these people that I'm interacting with to want to hear about this. So my prayer is, God, help the people that I'm working with. Help me to find the people I go to school with. Help me to find that person in my neighborhood who's yearning for you. Maybe who's going through a problem. Maybe who's asking the right questions. Who's just searching. God, help me to encounter that person. And let your spirit lead me to that. So we pray. And then we listen. We're really horrible at this because we've got a message because we're right and they're not right. We want to tell them how to be right. So, so we, we talk and we talk and we talk, but a big part of sharing the gospel is listening, listening to their beliefs, listening to their brokenness, listening to their problems, listening to their issues, listening to their dreams, listening to their desires. You listen to them so that you learn about them and then you spend time with them. You just spend time with them. And we are so busy today. We've got so much going on that we really lose track of this. If, if any of these people are looked at as projects, then we've, we've gone off track. This isn't a project for us. This is, I'm spending time with people so I can get to know them, not to make them believe something that's right. Remember what this is all about. This is all about a witness, a witness of what Jesus has done in me. And I'm, Pretty sure if someone else is going through a problem in their lives or someone else is as lost as I have been, that they might want to know that too. And I want to share that with them. So we 
we pray, we listen, we spend time, we serve. We do something for them, they do something for us. We find ways to, to help one another and then we share. And the sharing is natural. It's something that comes natural with friendships. Something that comes natural with building relationships. I don't think, we need to be intentional, don't get me wrong. We need to be intentional, but we don't need to be unnatural and forced. And my intentional sharing is I'm going to, I'm going to be really confident that as I build this relationship and we get together, we're gonna end up talking about deep spiritual things. We're gonna talk about what's most important in our life. And boy, when that door's open for me, I need to tell you what Jesus has done to save me and how he's changed me. And we just share. And we let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit's doing because he is all about, all about drawing people to himself. So that's the everyday Christian life kind of approach that we do. But we, we do see in this passage and in this early part of Acts that there has to be some intentionality of getting outside of ourselves, outside of people like us, to get to, to, get to people that are far away, to the Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And for that, I just want to say something incredible is happening here in St. Louis. I was talking to Brad Wass, who is a member of our church and works on our district leadership team as a multicultural ministry director. And he told me that St. Louis is recognized as the third fastest growing immigrant city in America right now. The third fastest growing immigrant city in America. Right here. Many of us can talk with people from other nations without leaving our neighborhoods now. We, we live among an international group. I think that's really important because part of what, I'm going to share a few opportunities that we have right here at First Free that you could be involved in to reach people that are not like you, to reach people who are international. We have an English as a Second Language ministry that meets here on, third, on Wednesday nights. It starts September 21st where we have people from in our community who are immigrants and refugees here who are new to St. Louis or have been in St. Louis a while and need to learn English because they don't know our language and they need to know how to interact. And they come here and we have an opportunity to build friendships. We have an opportunity to teach. We have an opportunity to share our lives with and to help them to get integrated into our culture, into our community and do it in the name of Jesus. What an incredible thing. They're coming here. They're coming here to us to do that. We still have room if you'd like to join this ministry there. And we work in teams, so it's not like you're on your own in this and we provide all the material. But if you go to efree.org slash serve, you can find out how you can be involved in our ESL program. It's a wonderful way to work out this, this ministry of reaching international people. And then there's something called Cup of Nations. We had the Cup of Nations youth soccer tournament a month ago or so. And next weekend is the adult soccer tournament, Cup of Nations. And so they're going to be this huge soccer tournament here in St. Louis with people from all over our area representing their home countries. And then they want people like you and me to just come and volunteer and mill around and help and build relationships and talk and build relationships and maybe share people with people the hope we have in Christ. It's, again, they're coming to us here to do that all around soccer. You can go to efree.org slash events to see more about that. And then you heard in the announcements today that Rachel, our local outreach coordinator, is taking a group from our church to West Des Moines, Iowa in October to go to the Good for All Conference, which is a conference that has nationally known speakers like Bob Goff and others. The whole two-day conference is focused on how do we as a church reach our community for Jesus? How do we go across the street and across town to reach people, people who are like us and immigrants in our community? So if you want to know more and join Rachel on that trip, you can go to efree.org slash events. And then there's Oasis International. Many of you are already partnering with Oasis, Oasis International. This is a great organization here in St. Louis that welcomes um, refugees coming to St. Louis from other countries and they desperately need people like you and I to just come alongside a refugee individual or family, help them get to know how to go to the bank, where do you go to the doctor, basic things that we take for granted that they don't know. And you can go to oasisforrefugees.org to find out more about that. And then the last thing that I want to share with you, which is something you could do individually or in your group, there's a study that you could do together, and it's 
It's a really powerful study called Welcoming the Nations Among Us, six lesson study to help you engage with your cross-cultural neighbors. You can find it at mobilization.org. It's the, put out by the Center for Mission Mobilization. This is just a six, six lessons to help you engage with the international people who live around you. It is such a powerful and practical study. So I encourage you to think about it in your group or even just individually or as a family, welcoming the nations among us. It's really, really important. And all of this to say, this is what I think the application of Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21 is all about. The Holy Spirit comes upon us to fill us for a purpose. And the purpose is to be a witness to people around us. Now let's jump back to Acts chapter 2 and wrap up. Verses 13 to 21. This is Peter kind of just, just explaining what just happened here. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they're all drunk, that's all. Peter stepped forward in the 11 apostles and shouted, Listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's much too early for that. No, what you, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn to blood before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now here we find Peter again just explaining, this is what's happening. This is what's happening here. God is fulfilling this prophecy of Joel. The last days, by the way, it's, it's kind of some points to the messianic age. It could be anything from the ministry of Jesus Christ here on earth all the way through to where we are today and to the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are the last days. And in the last day, we're going to see and are seeing incredible things happen. The cosmic the cosmos responded when Jesus was crucified. We see what happened here at Pentecost. There, there are ways in which the world is recognizing, that the nature around us is recognizing the work that God is doing. The early disciples looked at this to apply to Jesus and his life, especially that period following the resurrection. There's something supernatural going on here. And this cosmic imagery is pointing to that. The coming of the Spirit confirms the work of Jesus. And what, what we find in that prophecy in Joel is it's without limits of social class. There's no social class limit to have the Holy Spirit and to prophesy and to, to be a mouthpiece of God, to take the word of God and the ministry of Jesus to the nations. It's not age, it's not gender. It, it's poured out on all people who follow Jesus. The Spirit of God lives in us and among us. And this brings us to, to verse 21, which I think is a really good place to end for today. And then Adam's going to pick this up in a couple of weeks. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's easy to get in the weeds of this section. You've got the prophecy in Joel. You've got the tongues. What's this? What's this? What's this? But you know the bottom line? God is doing something that he wants us to be involved in so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So my question for you is, what will you do this week to be a witness for Jesus? What will you do this week as someone, a man or woman, filled with the Holy Spirit to be a witness? Maybe it's inviting that neighbor over for dinner, starting a relationship. Maybe it's, maybe it's asking a question to go a little deeper with that friend that you have that you need to talk to a little bit more. Maybe it's signing up for ESL where you're going to spend the next the next uh, season of Wednesday nights caring for and building relationships with people that are, that are coming from another culture. Maybe it's that nudge in your own life to go across the street or across the world to serve and to share this message. Let's take a minute and sit quietly and let the Holy Spirit apply to our own hearts what that action step is of who and how are you going to be a witness for him this week. Let's pray.